Thank you very much. It's it's my pleasure to talk with you today on the 45th anniversary of the dedication of the memorial, which is a part of the story I'm going to share today, but it's uh, it's not the entire story. Um, on the first anniversary of the Kennedy assassination, November 22, 1964, United Press International estimated that hundreds of John F. Kennedy memorial tributes had been established around the world. When that news story was revisited one year later, the Kennedy memorials around the globe numbered well into the thousands. Within a week of the assassination, Cape Canaveral became Cape Kennedy. Idlewild Airport in New York became John F. Kennedy International. Within two months, Congress voted to name the upcoming National Cultural Center in Washington, D.C., the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. In Massachusetts, the president's home state, there were so many memorial proposals that a special commission was created just to choose among them. Around the world, in addition to newly created statues and memorials, a number of schools, bridges, civic centers, golf courses, theaters, streets and avenues, even a forest and a mountain were renamed in memory of President Kennedy. But what about Dallas? Burdened with the stigma city of hate and unfairly characterized as a toxic environment dominated by right-wing extremism, Dallas was identified around the world as the place where Kennedy was shot. With Dealey Plaza the city's most visited site and with this building, the Texas School Book Depository, one of the world's most photographed structures, Dallas was the assassination was a painful memory for Dallas and few in this community were eager to perpetuate the tragedy with some permanent installation. So while detailing these grand memorials elsewhere in the United States, that UPI anniversary story from the second anniversary of the assassination in November 1965 briefly mentioned that Dallas would within a year unveil a bronze plaque in Dealey Plaza, and that a memorial structure designed by the architect Philip Johnson would follow a few blocks away. And it did about five years later in 1970. But overall, the Dallas response was lackluster by comparison. In a city so tormented by global tragedy, one might well ask, how do you commemorate such an emotionally charged site? More than 25 years after the Kennedy assassination, the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository became an exhibition on the life, death, and legacy of President Kennedy. Upon its opening, the sixth floor, later the sixth floor museum at Dealey Plaza, was characterized in the news media as the city's final response to November 22, 1963. The Chicago Tribune said that the somber display helped Dallas face its past. And accompanied by glowing coverage of the opening, the front page headline of the Dallas Times Herald that day read simply, today we stand whole again. So for the next few minutes, I'm gonna survey what took place between the Kennedy assassination in 1963 and the opening of this museum in 1989, we cannot address every memorial service or moment of silence, but I want to highlight some of the more interesting, controversial, and colorful uh, so-called permanent memorials that emerged during this 25-year uh, period. And we're going to begin with ex eccentric Dallas resident Dr. Cosette Faust Newton. Born in Kemp, Texas in 1889, uh, she earned two doctoral degrees and was at one time the only female PhD on the faculty of Southern Methodist University. But by the 1940s, her colorful antics had frustrated and bewildered many in the local community. For example, uh, she was once arrested for allegedly kidnapping her chauffeur and holding him hostage in her attic for five days. Um, later, she fought the township of Highland Park over a gigantic $60,000 model ship in her backyard, which she launched five days after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. At the time of the Kennedy assassination, uh, the flamboyant Cosette Faust Newton was preparing to open a building called the Miramar Museum on Cedar Springs Road and, and fill it with uh, trinkets from her world travels. She delayed the opening two weeks as a result of the uh, president's death. Now this, what we're looking at, is the Newton's 1963 Christmas card, which as you can see was dedicated uh, to the memory of President Kennedy. And inside is a poem that she wrote, and it seems fixated on the idea that President Kennedy passed by her soon-to-open museum 
and that his eyes absorbed its neon signage in the final moments of his life. Uh, the poem uh, reads, in part, Alive and well, he motored by. Ten minutes later, he had to die. Alive and well, he passed this door. A little later, he was no more. And skipping to the very end, Alive and well, he grasped our thought. Ten minutes later, his doom was wrought. Alive and well, he absorbed our sign. So now our building's a hero's shrine. She dedicated her museum to President Kennedy, and the marquee outside declared it, quote, a hero's shrine dedicated to the martyrized John F. Kennedy, end quote. A window display further dedicated the museum to Jacqueline Kennedy. She the queenly heroine of the hour. While this timely rebranding of the Miramar Museum may have been the first local memorial to President Kennedy, the first to genuinely emerge at a site as associated with the assassination came in October 1964 at the Dallas Trademark. The Eagle, which was a uh, four foot wide bronze sculpture, was not an original. It was one of five authorized replicas of the lectern of the Cathedral Church of St. Michael in Coventry, England. The creator, Elizabeth Frink, was especially commissioned to create a unique pedestal for the Dallas installation that includes a quote from William Blake taken from his book, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, written between 1790 and 1793. When thou seest an eagle, thou seest a portion of genius lift up thy head. It was dedicated by the friends of John F. Kennedy who had awaited his arrival at the trademark luncheon on November 22nd. The eagle was one of 11 contemporary pieces found in the International Sculpture Garden at the trademark. Bishop Cuthbert Baldsley of Coventry said in his dedication that as the eagle soars into the air, so may we believe that the soul of John F. Kennedy soars into life and into eternity. The eagle can still be seen today just outside the main entrance to the trademark. A home at 3802 Oak Lawn became a unique memorial to President Kennedy in May 1965. The John F. Kennedy Living Center for Exceptional Youth was billed as the first boarding home in the United States for mentally challenged young adult men. The founder was Dixie Shelley Jones, an independently wealthy registered nurse who also administered the Children's Haven, a 60-bed children's hospital on Fairmount Street in Dallas, as well as a research foundation and a summer camp facility in New Mexico, all of which benefited the mentally challenged. Now, unusual for Dallas memorials, the uh, Living Center boasted direct involvement from the Kennedy family. The late president's sister, Eunice Kennedy Shriver, the founder of the Special Olympics, visited the site a month prior to opening and had previously endorsed the concept. The dedication was held on what would have been President Kennedy's 48th birthday, May 29th, 1965. Mayor Earl Cabell, and that's him clapping on the left in this picture, along with Judges Sarah T. Hughes and Lou Sterrett, um, were, were together on the stage as a telegram from President Lyndon Johnson was read aloud congratulating those who had sponsored this worthy cause to which President Kennedy was so dedicated. Also in attendance that day was Mrs. Marie Tippett, the wife, uh, the widow of the slain Dallas police officer J.D. Tippett, and the Reverend Oscar Huber, who had administered the last rites for President Kennedy at Parkland Hospital. Now, great emphasis was placed on the bust of President Kennedy, which was unveiled that day. The sculptor, Anthony Paness, that's him on the right, was a 63-year-old from Paris, Texas, and he toiled for 15 months on the bronze effigy and he wept as the bust was unveiled while an Air Force band played God Bless America. He considered it one of his finest works, which is interesting considering that Anthony Paness is best known as the man who sculpted Abraham Lincoln's left eyebrow uh, on Mount Rushmore. Now, not everyone was impressed with the uh, Kennedy bust. Dallas Morning News reporter Kent Biffle described this depiction of President Kennedy as that of a puffy-faced man with a curiously amused expression. Paness explained that the president's expression came to him in a dream. 
Now, for reasons unknown, this original bust had been substituted with this equally curious likeness by 1971. Uh, despite being designed for young adults, the first residents or patients, as they were called in the news media, were actually children ages 5 to 13. They were soon dubbed the Kennedy Kids, and they were occasionally visited by special guests passing through Dallas, including Muriel, Heming or Muriel Humphrey, wife of the vice president. Senator Ralph Yarborough dressed as Santa Claus at Christmas 1966 and passed out gifts to the Kennedy kids. The center held well-attended November 22nd memorial services, always officiated by the Reverend Oscar Huber. But sadly, this permanent memorial was short-lived. On the night of May 27, 1972, a two-alarm fire swept through the center while 12 patients ages 9 to 20 and their counselors and caregivers all scrambled to safety. No one was injured and no cause was determined, though the center had been a buzz of activity that day in preparation for the boys' upcoming summer trip to New Mexico. The center, completely destroyed with damages estimated at more than $50,000, was not rebuilt, although Dixie Shelley Jones' primary Dallas facility, the Children's Haven, remained in operation. Another Dallas memorial tribute, though of a considerably different tone, was unveiled in the mid-1960s. The Southwestern Historical Wax Museum opened with the State Fair of Texas in 1963 in the Varied Industries Building and then became a year-round exhibit in the Creative Arts Building at Fair Park. Beginning less than a year after the assassination, the museum unveiled a series of vignettes meant to memorialize the late president's visit to Dallas. So here we have the arrival at Dallas Love Field with President and Mrs. Kennedy, along with the governor and Mrs. Connolly. Adjacent to this was a, uh, a tableau depicting the swearing-in of Vice President Lyndon Johnson. Judge Sarah T. Hughes, the, the real one, was on hand to dedicate this wax diorama in September of 1964. But it was the third diorama adjacent to the swearing-in that proved the most controversial. And we have some great color film of the unveiling of this uh, unique depiction. Yes, you can see it upset that young man quite a bit. It's Lee Harvey Oswald, rifle in hand, standing next to school book boxes. The Associated Press called this figure eerie and discomforting. The museum's longtime creative director, Drew Hunter, said that over the years, there were a few that thought it was disrespectful to have it right there next to Kennedy. It was a little sensationalistic, but it's a wax museum, you know. One admirer of this particular figure was Lee Harvey Oswald's mother, Marguerite, who visited her son's likeness on more than one occasion, usually after alerting local news media of her upcoming visit. Uh, photographing her son's figure in 1965, she told museum officials that while Oswald's hairline was incorrect, they had captured his mouth perfectly. To complete the memorial of, to President Kennedy, adjacent to the Oswald tableau was an empty rocking chair illuminated by a single spotlight. This assassination display was later joined by a vignette depicting Abraham Lincoln's shooting at Ford's Theater, and this entire uh, section of the museum made the move from Fair Park to the uh, museum's new location in Grand Prairie, Texas in May 1972. The Kennedy scenes remained a key part of the displays as this museum grew to become the largest wax museum in the United States. But sadly, the entire museum was destroyed by a four-alarm fire in 1988 that officials believe started in the building's electrical wiring. More than 300 wax figures and hundreds of historical artifacts were lost in the blaze. The first memorial at the site of the assassination uh, began to take shape in the summer of 1965. It was an effort launched by a single individual, Richardson, Texas resident Martina Langley, who visited Dealey Plaza more than a hundred times over a year and a half to pay her respects and speak with visitors from around the world. She joined a dozen other individuals in organizing the Committee for Kennedy Assassination Site Memorial. Langley and her associates passed out leaflets in Dealey Plaza and demanded that the site be respected as it was as historically significant as Ford's Theater in Washington. 
The committee's efforts led the Dallas Park Board to propose a multi-paneled bronze marker mounted on marble supports near the statue of George Bannerman Dealey, where a bronze display honoring Dealey was already installed. As originally designed, these uh, new plaques would only briefly mention the president's shooting beneath eight detailed paragraphs about the city's early history. Though the park board twice approved the wording of this $8,500 marker, Langley protested that the Dallas historical information was extraneous, and she appealed the matter before the Dallas City Council in March of 1966. After some heated discussion, the city council finally agreed, and the twin 500-pound bronze plaques installed in November of that year acknowledge only the Kennedy assassination. One displayed a map of Dealey Plaza identifying the motorcade route and the approximate location where the shooting took place. The second plaque described the shooting in a very straightforward manner, primarily providing directional information. The name Lee Harvey Oswald was deleted during the final review, although the plaque did acknowledge the findings of the Warren Commission. On November 22, 1966, the third anniversary of the assassination, Langley led several hundred people in a memorial service in front of the plaques, where her children placed a large floral display bearing the message, Lest We Forget. This marker is still in its original location. You can see it uh, right outside in Dealey Plaza. Now, one of the key reasons that Langley pushed for a Dealey Plaza memorial was that she was unhappy that the city's official memorial tribute to John F. Kennedy was to be located a few blocks away behind the old red courthouse and was delayed for a number of years. The John F. Kennedy Memorial, designed by architect Philip Johnson, was dedicated on June 24th, 1970, 45 years ago today. Plans began within days of the assassination when County Judge Lou Sterrett proposed a Dallas memorial to the fallen president. The idea was immediately controversial, with many, including former Dallas Mayor R.L. Thornton and then Mayor Earl Cabell, proposing that Dallas actively contribute to a national memorial in Washington, D.C. instead. Nearly 200 people sent in letters arguing that there should be a living memorial, calling for a Kennedy scholarship program or a monetary contribution to the arts instead of a permanent memorial structure. When consulted, the Kennedy family suggested something very simple, and they approved the selection of Philip Johnson, a family friend, as the architect. Although the Dallas County Commissioner's Court designated the site for the memorial structure in 1964 across from the new courthouse and some 200 yards from the assassination site, the project was delayed uh, for several years while donations were solicited and an underground parking garage was constructed at the site. The memorial is a roofless room 30 feet tall and 50 feet square with a simple black granite slab in the center. Philip Johnson envisioned something very humble and Spartan, a memorial for one whose remains lie elsewhere. Despite the addition of uh, interpretive signage, which explains the concept of this cenotaph or open tomb, the memorial confused visitors expecting to find a statue or a bust of the late president inside. The Dallas Morning News once called it a stark and ugly monument, though it has served a very unique purpose over these decades as a gathering place for assassination memorial services, for concerts and community activism, which always seeks to link the memory and the unfulfilled promise of President Kennedy to modern day social issues. In summer 1970, shortly after the dedication of the John F. Kennedy Memorial, construction began on a 10,000 square foot privately owned museum on the first floor of the former Dow Tex building at 501 Elm Street, just across Houston Street from the Texas School Book Depository. Uh, for those of you who have been on the site today, uh, where our museum store and cafe is located, that is where this museum was uh, in the early 1970s. Dallas residents John and Estelle Sissom established their museum as both an opportunity for profit and also to set the record straight about Dallas. John Sissom had a varied background, a one-time professional magician. He had owned a joke and novelty shop, a service station, and a series of gift shops before launching into the museum business with himself as both the owner and curator. 
As one can imagine, a for-profit and decidedly homemade museum just steps from the assassination site generated controversy. In 1971, the Dallas Times Herald questioned whether this facility was a specialized historical collection or a ghoulish attraction. For a time, when the museum brought in several hundred visitors each day, it was considered one of the city's most popular tourist attractions, although not all of its customers were impressed. William Perry, who was a, a director with the National Association for Mental Health, was so incensed by what he described as a horror show that he immediately wrote to Senator Edward Kennedy, and implored him to take action to make sure that this cheap display closed its doors. Kennedy offered no comment and took no action. The museum itself was comprised of a few Kennedy mementos, newspaper reproductions, and photographs. One highlight, according to the promotional material, was this shrine-like space, which featured a Kennedy portrait painted by Dallas artist Dimitri Vail. John Sissom acknowledged that while he had received some criticism for his museum, he stressed, I feel we have done more for the memory of President Kennedy than others in Dallas. His museum emerged in part, he said, from the fact that nothing else had been done. Now, the photographs, the text panels in this memorial painting were all just preludes for the signature installation, which was a 22-minute multimedia presentation designed by Sissom called The Incredible Hours. Against this uh, painted backdrop of uh, Dealey Plaza and a portion of downtown Dallas was a dramatic program where a, a string of lights followed the motorcade route accompanied by music, narration, and slides. It was an intricate system, and Sissom actually received a U.S. patent for his apparatus in 1974. His application described it as, quote, an automated theater in which timing pulses picked up from the sound recording control the illumination of indicator lights and a plurality of slide projectors, end quote. Uh, now, here is a close-up of a small portion of the system model that is today in the collections uh, here at the Sixth Floor Museum. So you can get a sense just from this little little detail uh, of the hand-painted buildings and all the little hand-painted figures, and you can see what the uh, entire model would have looked like. Uh, Sissom's museum lasted 11 years before he lost his lease during a major building renovation which began in 1982. Now, it had some difficulties along the way. According to a family friend, the Sissoms were crushed when an employee stole thousands of dollars for, from them, and John and Estelle had to personally uh, handle ticket sales at the museum. And there was also petty vandalism, as uh, demonstrated in these photographs we're looking at here. This is the Lee Harvey Oswald rifle display uh, in 1971, and then jumping forward to 1979, you can see that those rifle shells and the ammunition clip have been stolen right off the wall, uh, but the uh, hardened glue remains on display. The Dallas Times Herald story here on uh, the closing of the uh, Kennedy Museum mentioned, the bathrooms are dingy, here and there a light is burned out, and several pictures are missing from the displays. For a brief time, John Sissom hoped to relocate, but in the end, he decided to donate most of his museum's contents to the organizers of what would become the Sixth Floor Exhibit inside the Texas School Book Depository. But sadly, as with the Wax Museum and the John F. Kennedy Living Center, fire plays a role in this story, too. In August 1984, uh, during the Republican National Convention in Dallas, uh, there was an arson attempt on this building, Texas School Book Depository. This five-alarm fire, which caused approximately $250,000 worth of damage, began in the building's basement, right where the system material was being stored, and much of it was destroyed. What material did survive the blaze today remains part of the museum's collection. And that brings us full circle here to the site of the assassination in Dealey Plaza. After the Texas School Book Depository Company vacated this building in 1970, an effort was launched to demolish this structure. Removing it would help, some believed, erase the painful memory of the Kennedy assassination. A seven-year battle between community leaders, private developers, Dallas City Council members, and county officials resulted in the depository being purchased by Dallas County in 1977 to serve as the seat of county government. The top two floors, six and seven here, 
were left empty while conversations began about a possible historical exhibition inside the building. And it took more than a decade for the sixth floor exhibit to become a reality. Uh, in this picture, we see the construction of the visitor center where you walked in today, along with the elevator that you took to get to this floor. And this is from the spring of 1988. A number of community leaders, historians, politicians, and museum professionals uh, contributed to the sixth floor project, but the key figures are these two ladies right here. Local preservation activist Lyndalyn Adams on the right and Conover Hunt, a historian and author from Virginia who had moved to Dallas in the late 1970s. The sixth floor exhibition opened on President's Day, February 20th, 1989, a little over 25 years after the Kennedy assassination. In the memory books at the conclusion of the exhibit, Many in those early days reflected on their own memories of the Kennedy assassination, acknowledging how the exhibit brought the era back to life for a few moments. One lifelong city resident wrote that after Kennedy was shot, she was angry and ashamed to live in the community. Today in 89 on the sixth floor, she wrote, more than 25 years after the Kennedy assassination, I'm proud to be a Dallasite. The museum, which many had opposed during its long development, has today uh, become part of this cultural landscape of Dallas. It's a site of research, education, memory, and history. This slow process of memorialization really exemplifies how difficult it was for the city of Dallas to come to terms with its dark legacy and internalize this terrible moment in time. So what we find in Dallas between 1964 and 1989 was largely this uncertain commercialization of the assassination, arguments and controversy, and a series of grassroots efforts fueled by just one or two passionate individuals. The city's official memorial was long delayed and then became a point of confusion and debate. And during all of this, the Texas School Book Depository lingered, in the words of one writer, staring with vacant and accusing eyes. To quote Richard Sellers of the National Park Service, do we dare preserve what still hurts? Ultimately, Dallas found a way to make that happen, not just demonstrated by the 26-year history of, of this institution, the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza, but by the city's commemorative efforts during the 50th anniversary in November 2013. So when a news story is written in 2063, recounting all of the various memorials and tributes to President Kennedy found around the world, in the long term, Dallas's efforts will hopefully rank near the top of that list. Thank you very much. We have some microphones if there are any questions about the museum's history or the uh, the sort of strange memorialization of Kennedy in Dallas. Uh, we'll be happy to take those. We are recording this program, so we want to we want to hear you on the microphone. Hi. What was your favorite uh, memorial to research? <laughs> <laughs> um, the, well, as you can see, there are a lot of colorful ones. Um, certainly. Um, the Wax Museum figures and that great color film of, of Lee Harvey Oswald's figure, which unfortunately the playback wasn't very good today, but uh, but that was pretty interesting. Also, uh, Dr. Cosette Faust Newton's Miramar Museum. She had such a, a rich, um, colorful history, and there are articles uh, in uh, Legacy's Dallas History Journal, which you can access online if you want to read more about the interesting life and times of Cosette Faust Newton. But I found her uh, sort of instantaneous rebranding of her museum in memory of Kennedy pretty interesting as well. Um, when I came to the museum, and uh, probably right after it opened, um, it was really the first time I had ever heard about the quote-unquote magic bullet. And was any of the controversy about opening the museum, about how to address all the um, conspiracy and confidence in the war, or lack of confidence in the Warren Report? 
Um, certainly, uh, the development of the museum, which was really um, an effort that took between 10 and 12 years, uh, it, it took dozens of people trying to filter the story down to the life, death, and legacy of President Kennedy told within the history and context of the time period. There was a decision made early on to uh, acknowledge the official government investigations and acknowledge the lingering conspiracy theories, but not go into um, into too much depth on any of those topics. Um, the museum helps to preserve the, the memory and the emotion of a moment in time. And you have to remember when our facility opened in 1989, uh, about two thirds of our audience could remember exactly where they were when President Kennedy was shot. It's, it's shifted almost entirely now to I think closer to two thirds not being rememberers of that moment. So, so there is a responsibility to tell that story as, as um, truthfully as we can, looking at the photographs and the evidence available and letting our visitors make up their own minds. Um, I, as Nick, Nicola briefly mentioned at the beginning, I did write a book on the history of the museum and I detailed at, at length the long involved process of making this site a, a, a memorial to President Kennedy and opening the museum at the site. So if you, uh, if you want to read further on that, you certainly can check out a, a copy of the book. It's called Assassination and Commemoration. Yeah, hi. Why does the plaque downstairs say Lee Harvey Oswald allegedly shot the president? Oh, good question. Uh, that is the Texas State Historical Marker, and that was uh, unveiled at the site here in March of 1981. Um, this building, as I mentioned during the program, the building was purchased by Dallas County as a very small part of a bond election in 1977. Um, there's a long, sordid history here, but while there was this a ferocious debate to demolish the building. Very quietly, the public works director for Dallas County, working behind the scenes with the mayor of Dallas at the time, Wes Wise, uh, <coughs> excuse me, was able to sort of slip the depository purchase into this large, massive 1977 bond election, which passed. And so the county occupied the building. They renovated the first few floors into county offices. And when it reopened in March of 1981, ironically, one day before the attempted uh, assassination of President Reagan, um, the building had this uh, Texas Historical Commission uh, marker unveiled. And the marker uh, does say it's still downstairs uh, on the outside of the building. Uh, it says that uh, from the sixth floor, Lee Harvey Oswald allegedly shot at President Kennedy. And you might notice that the word allegedly is deeply underlined. And, and it wasn't like that in the original plaque. A lot of people think that the emphasis was on the original plaque. But what's happened is people, um, theorists who don't believe Oswald was uh, responsible, or at least by himself, for the assassination have etched under that word allegedly with keys and coins over these many decades to emphasize that word. But it wasn't emphasized in the original plaque. As far as why that word was used in the beginning, um, Oswald never went to trial, so he was never convicted of any crime. So typically, and the museum to this day, uses the words allegedly or accused uh, when describing Lee Harvey Oswald as the assassin of President Kennedy. Hi. What is on the first, second, third, and fourth, fifth story of the building? <laughs> Good question. Uh, you might notice that when you boarded the elevator, come up to the sixth or seventh floors, those are your only choices, one, six, and seven. You're riding th uh, up an external elevator shaft, and the reason for that is because uh, floors one through five are county offices. This is the seat of Dallas County government, so we have a two-story commissioner's courtroom on the uh, first two floors, offices of the county commissioners, public works for Dallas County, and directly below the um, sixth floor exhibit is the uh, civil division of the Dallas District Attorney's Office. So you have a, a fully functioning county building and that outside elevator allows an upwards of 300,000 visitors to uh, access the museum uh, without disturbing county business on the other floors of the building. And the reason Dallas County bought the building was quite literally to save it from being torn down. Yeah. Was the Kennedy family consulted for input as the museum was being formulated and have any Kennedy family members visited the museum since its opening in the late 80s? Good question. As, as you can imagine, it's a question we get a lot. Uh, out, of, um, out of respect for uh, the family and the pain and, and, and turmoil they went through after the assassination, they weren't actively engaged in any part of the uh, Six Floors uh, development. One of our founding board members, uh, we are a nonprofit foundation, the Dallas County Historical Foundation, one of our founding board members was a close friend of Senator 
Ted Kennedy, and she kept him informally briefed on the project during its development, but no uh, content or um, uh, input was sought from the family as well. There have been uh, family members who have visited over the years out of respect for their privacy. We never identify uh, any of our guests or talk about their experiences, but uh, but yes, some family members have visited over the years. Um, when the exhibition first opened, was it intended to be permanent or was it just intended to be a temporary exhibition back in 89? Good question. Uh, certainly the um, building of the visitor center and the external elevator shaft, I mean, that was a uh, considered a permanent structure, but no one really knew if this experiment would work. There were definitely those who felt that within three to five years, the uh, curiosity of going up to the sixth floor, of looking out that window, um, that, that people would satisfy their curiosity and the museum may not last beyond, you know, the first few years. What really changed things, surprisingly perhaps, was in 1991, you might remember uh, Oliver Stone's film JFK came out and that introduced a whole new generation to the assassination and its its intricate mysteries and lingering questions. And uh, as a result of that film, attendance at the museum increased dramatically. And we were able to settle our debt uh, a few years ahead of schedule. And it really did um, increase visitation to the point where at one time, you know, we did become the second most visited historic site in the entire state of Texas behind the Alamo. Uh, and so ever since then, we have been considered this museum. The name was changed from the sixth floor exhibit in the mid 1990s to the sixth floor museum later the sixth floor museum at Dealey Plaza and we have grown as an institution with our collections with our ongoing oral history project with our public programming and education initiatives and and as I mentioned in the talk we have become we have uh, journeyed I suppose from what many did perceive to be a temporary exhibition to this integral part of the uh, historical landscape of Dallas, the historical narrative that this city is continuing to tell as it has come to embrace this, this very dark moment in its past. Well, thank you folks very much. I'll linger if there are other questions or if you have stories about the Kennedy assassination, we'd be happy to talk with you about those too. Thank you very much for being here today.